when you wish upon a star, sometimes you get a dang interesting story. Okay, so it is Patreon sponsored review time and this time I got commissioned to take a look at Stardust. Now this is the film, 2007 I believe film, based off the Neil Gaiman book of the same name. And I get to do something that I don't get to do that often and actually draw comparisons between the book and the movie because I read the book. I think this actually might, might have been one of the few times that I read the book before I saw the movie. That happens very rarely. I've talked about why I don't, I try not to do that deliberately, but like sometimes a book that I have already read gets made into a movie and that was the case here. Now, <laughs> I'd wanted to like continue to stretch myself a little bit in terms of the editing, get fancy, use clips to illustrate the things, except <laughs> I fired it up and you know what I saw right at the beginning was the Paramount logo. So there aren't gonna be any clips. Actually, there aren't gonna be any images at all. Because uh, if you're new around these parts, Paramount are the biggest jerks uh, when it comes to copyright, the most unreasonable. And um, yeah, I'm not gonna give you a history of my problems with them. Just uh, remember around here we say, fuck Paramount. But uh, I'm not gonna hold that against the movie because, you know, sometimes good movies get stuck with jackass distributors. Anyways, so Stardust, is uh, is a film that okay? How do we how do we describe this thing? What I would say is it it's a modern take on a fairy tale. It, it, I say modern; it's not like set in modern day, but it's a, sort of a reinterpretation on the fairy tale stylings by way of sort of swashbuckling adventure. Tonally, I would compare it to The Princess Bride. I don't want to overstress that comparison, though, because it is sort of going things about going about things in a bit of a different way, and I don't want to like force people to like say they prefer one or the other. But I think overall tone, vibe, feel of the thing is reminiscent of The Princess Bride. And actually, the director Matthew Vaughn cited that as an inspiration. And that, honestly, aside from a couple of things that I'll talk about later, is the major difference between the book and the movie. The book is a fairy tale for adults in a bit more of an adult sense. While I wouldn't say that the book is excessively graphic, um, it is pretty blunt uh, when it comes to things like violence, death, sexual content, and so forth. Whereas the movie is PG-13. So that stuff is there, we just don't, we don't see it in all of its juicy details. I wish I'd picked a different word. Ah, <sighs> I'm sorry. But um, that's the major difference aside from a couple of logistical story differences. And obviously a lot of stuff got cut because the the book, I mean, that's, that. I'm, I don't even have to justify that. A novel always has stuff cut into a movie. The only way you don't get anything cut is if you make a friggin' miniseries or a long-running TV show, and even then, stuff usually still gets cut. So, the plot um, is primarily about a character named Tristan Thorne, who's played by Charlie Cox, better known these days as Matt Murdock, or Daredevil, in the Netflix Daredevil series. And uh, it's actually kind of really fun watching him do this because, you know, Matt Murdock is such a misery guts. He's such a sad sack that it's really nice to see um, Charlie Cox get to play somebody, you know, lighter, more freewheeling, a bit more up for adventure than, you know, than Matt is. Um, so he just lives in a fairly ordinary town in England called Wall. And it's so named because there is a wall that separates the town from what looks like a field. And there's a gap in the wall that's guarded by uh, a rather old guard. Um, and, you know, people don't pass through the gap in the wall, except Tristan's father did once upon a time. And now Tristan himself goes on an adventure on the other side of the wall, which basically takes them to an entire different world. Um, basically a fairy tale world, for lack of a better term. And the reason Tristan goes there is because he's trying to impress a local girl named Victoria, played by Sienna Miller. And um, when they see a falling star, he says, I'll go find you and bring you that star to prove my love. And it fell on the other side of the wall. That's where he goes. And when he gets there, what he finds is not a lump of rock 
Uh, what he finds instead is a woman named Vane, played by Claire Danes, who is in fact the fallen star. And he then goes about trying to bring her back to show to Victoria. She doesn't really like that. That's obviously the tension between the two of them. There are additional complications in the form of why the star fell in the first place. So, boy, I'm going into way more detail in the plot than I normally would. But, like, I don't know how well seen this movie is at this point. Um, but anyways, so... <laughs> In a, in a wonderful cameo by the late, great Peter O'Toole, playing the dying king of, of Stormhold, which is sort of the name of this realm, um, he has, four, well, when the film starts, he has four son, sons left. It's very quickly brought down to three. Um, and he's a little bit annoyed because he originally had seven sons. And traditionally what happens in this kingdom is, however many sons there are, kill each other until there's only one left and that one gets to be the heir. Well, King's on his dying, on his deathbed, and there's three left. So that's a problem. This wasn't supposed to happen. So the way he decides to go ahead and fix that is by taking the jewel off his crown. He throws it up into the sky where it hits the star and both come crashing down to earth. And he tasks his remaining sons to um, get the stone and Whoever gets the stone gets to be the next king. And so you've got these, uh, these other forces trying to find the stone that happens to be on a, on a chain around a vein's neck. And then, additional complication, there is a witch played by Michelle Pfeiffer. And she, uh, on behalf of herself and her sisters, is looking for the star to cut out her heart so they can eat it and be young and beautiful again. So, you basically have three parties interested in the star, interested in Yvain. One is Tristan, uh, then there's the witch, and then there's the princes. So, you've got all this going on in this world that has magic and unicorns and transformation of people into animals or animals into people and and soothsayers and pirates who capture lightning from from live storms and sell it to on the black market and all this kind of stuff um is where all this is set and that's your setting for your rollicking fantasy adventure story now i i haven't seen stardust in a long time like i i owned it so it, it was like it was nice to be commissioned to to watch it because like i didn't have to I didn't have to acquire it from somewhere else. I didn't have to rent it. I didn't have to search for it on streaming. I'm like, oh, I'll, I'll go downstairs and get it off the shelf. Um, but I haven't seen it in ages. I can't remember the last time I saw this movie. So part of me was a little nervous because, you know, when you haven't seen something for a while, particularly something that you know contains things that you might be more sensitive about now, than you were when you saw it before. And I'll get into detail on that stuff a little bit later. Anyone who's seen the movie probably knows what I'm talking about, but I'll sort of hold that for a little bit. Stick a pin in that, we'll come back to it. Um, the movie is a lot of fun. Uh, the actors all seem like they're having an absolute blast doing this. Uh, Robert De Niro plays the, the the captain of the the ship for the for the guys who like capture lightning. Captain Shakespeare, um, who's who's another one of the big differences from the book. He's pretty much a a creation entirely of the movie. The pirates capturing lightning they do exist in the book for one page. It's literally like a stopover reference thing to help. Tristan and Vane get from point A to point B at one point, and like none of them are named and there's no lingering there. So this entire character of Captain Shakespeare and his crew was basically developed by Matthew Vaughn and, uh, and the other people behind this movie. So uh, that's another thing that's pretty unique to this. And he's obviously having an absolute blast doing this. I, for me, though, I think the MVP is Michelle Pfeiffer, because not only is she clearly having a lot of fun playing this, I think there's... Oh, God, you know, I hate the word I'm about to use because using this to describe an actor is like, it's so freaking cliche, but I, it's the one that's stuck in my head. I think there's something kind of brave in her playing the witch. And again, 
I, I, I kind of, I'm kind of mad at myself for even saying that. But what I mean by that is, um, she, and, and I mean more so now, but even at the t even at the time this came out over ten years ago, was at an age where basically women don't get to play the female romantic lead anymore, and they they have to start playing the mothers the and possibly the crones and things like that. But Michelle Pfeiffer still looked great, but also you could tell she was no longer a young woman. So I think there was a bit of there there was. Maybe bravery isn't the wrong way. There was a bit of uh, thumbing her nose at the expectations of Hollywood to take on this role where she gets to, at some points, play it very beautiful and gorgeous. And, but, like, trying to hold on to that is the entire point of the character. And every time she uses magic, she ages visibly until, like, towards the end, she looks awful. And Michelle Pfeiffer, like, really altering her her physicality because, you know, when she's young and vibrant, she she's physically, you know, vivacious. And later on, like, she's all hunched over and, like, these slow movements. You can practically hear her bones creaking. It's really great. Uh, some other people who are in this... I mean, I'll mention Charlie Cox again. He is very good. He's very likable pretty much immediately. So he works very well. Henry Cavill's in this. Not, like, briefly, but, like, just as a jerk. Like, this has got an odd number of, uh, like, superheroes turn up in this. It's interesting. Um, but we've also got Mark Strong, who's played Sinestro in a superhero movie. Well, and he's gonna be the villain in the Shazam movie. Mark Strong has played a lot of villains, and he plays one of the, he plays the youngest of the brothers. He plays Septimus. And this is probably my favorite villain ish because like a lot of these characters are kind of like i don't know if you're like a villain but you're certainly a problem here um and uh, because of for what is normal and villainous by the standards of this world it's set in it's a little weird but i think this is my favorite um intimidating villain style turn from mark strong i really love him in this part uh and again he feels like he's getting to have a little bit more fun here than he sometimes is i think sometimes he he really is expected to to be like just the serious mm, you know and things like when he was in the 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 sherlock holmes or honestly when they had him do sinestro and he wasn't even a villain in that one yet um and and some things like that but I really do enjoy him quite a bit uh, in this, and I think he does great work. You have also got Jason Fleming as as uh, Primus, who's the oldest brother. Um, they, and we see some others. There's also a, there's a really funny cameo for one of the one of the brothers uh, who we see early on, and I don't want to spoil who that is if you haven't seen the movie because it's quite funny. Um, and there's there is a lot of humor, which again it adds more towards the swashbuckling adventure uh, feel to the movie that the book doesn't have, because the book has a very literate sensibilities, which most of Neil Gaiman's writing tends to have. And and actually, I hold this up as a pretty good example of the kinds of changes you need to make to something to make it work better in the medium you're now working with. Because pretty much all the things that they changed in terms of what was removed and the streamlining and, and what the changes were in service of were all working towards making it work better as a film. Because a lot of what works about the book is stuff that doesn't translate the 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 literary flow of a fairy tale because it is written in a way to evoke a fairy tale doesn't have a direct translation and more to the point the book doesn't really have a climax it just kind of goes until it ends until you know it, it reaches its ending where you get your little and then this happened then that and that the end um, but it doesn't have, it certainly doesn't have a cinematic climax. It arguably doesn't really have a climax at all. And in a movie, you kind of need one. And they do manufacture one. That said, the film could still stand to be streamlined a little bit more than it is. The movie runs over two hours, and I think there's probably about 20 minutes that could have been shaved from it particularly from the tail end and actually from the climax. And I am going to get into a little bit of spoilers. I'm not going to go into heavy detail here, but I mean, it, if you haven't already seen it, what I'm about to describe as far as the climax goes, you know, has to do with 
what's happening towards the end, if you know everyone's looking for the star, the, what I'm about to describe is not really a spoiler. It's a setup you should appreciate. So we're in a situation where all interested parties, the, the surviving princes, the witch, and Tristan are all converging on Yvain. And it's actually building really amazingly as they're all, all coming together and like, boy, this is really got to come to a head. But it doesn't. What happens is Yvain gets kidnapped by one of the people involved, taken somewhere else, and then the others have to go to this other place and we have to, we have to build a new head of steam for a climax. And it's really kind of odd. It built to a very organic, natural climax and then stops it, moves the entire thing to a different location, and then has to try and pick up the momentum of the climax again. And it really does feel like it loses steam a bit by doing that. I mean, the the setting where everything was originally converging was maybe a little dull. So, I mean, you just move that somewhere else and have the climax happen at the natural point, which is about 20 minutes before the thing ended. Um, there's other little things here and there that could have been trimmed down. Um, and, and, and things of that nature, but that's sort of the one major thing for me. But I, I also don't want to harp too much on complaints because this movie is a lot of fun and I enjoy it a lot, but I am going to get into a little bit more details about a specific thing because if you know me and you know the fact that I am gender fluid and I care about representation of gender fluidity and cross-dressing, then yeah, there's something else we got to talk about here. So if you haven't seen it, and it sounded interesting, maybe go watch it before I, I start to dive into this and like ruin the fun for you. So let's talk about the uh, sort of transgender and then the cross-dressing characters. So first there's Bernard, who uh, is a young man turned first into a goat and then turned into a young woman. I don't want to dwell on that because actually I don't think there's anything particularly problematic about it. Like he's kind of impressed with his own breasts when he has them, but, you know, who wouldn't be? And I don't see that as any kind of representation because it was a circumstance foisted onto him because the witch did that to him, and then he just kind of goes along with what's going on. He's just trying to not get killed. But I don't find anything particularly problematic or, um, you know, exemplary as representation with him. But it would have been weird if I hadn't acknowledged that. So let's get to the real thing. Captain Shakespeare, played by Robert De Niro, is uh, an effeminate man uh, who cross-dresses. And I was really nervous to revisit this because I remember being okay with it when I saw it. But like I said, I like... I'm a bit more sensitive to this than I used to be since I've started really examining the patterns that I see. For the most part, this whole end and this character held up a lot better than I expected. I think a big part of what helps is that, well, a couple of things. First of all, he's hiding this from his crew, but he's actually very happy to have someone to talk to who he doesn't have to worry about his reputation with. So he has Yvain and Tristan, and he's, he's, oh, he's basically out to them, and that's kind of sweet. And so that immediately helps establish that he's not embarrassed. He's not humiliated. He's not ashamed. But he is concerned for his reputation as a hard-nosed pirate. And he is afraid of the hit that that will take and that his crew won't respect him. So he has what feels like a pretty justified fear of how the world will react to him, but he himself has no shame about who he is or how he lives. So that helps. That's the first thing. The other thing is, is that he's pretty competent in a number of areas. Not all of them. It's actually demonstrated that he can't pilot his ship very well, but he's a pretty good swordsman. He, you know, teaches Tristan how to use a sword pretty well. He can captain this crew. He, he, I mean, he knows he has has skills. He is competent. So it's not like he is, you know, faking skill. He just has this whole other set of stuff about him that he doesn't let his crew know. And then, of course, we later learn when his crew does find out that they kind of always suspect it and are totally cool with it, which is also nice. There is a little bit of a problem for me, though, and that is the extended scene of him in a dress sort of flouncing around in his closet um, in the mirror. And I kind of have two problems with this. Um, the, the big one is just how long it goes on. Because the length of time that this is happening really 
does give the feel that we are meant to find this inherently funny and that this is something that, ah, uh, hey, look at the guy in a dress. Isn't that funny? Ha, ha, ha. Um, and in and of itself, the scene kind of does that anyway, but how long it goes on, it really does does make it feel that way. Um, and then the other thing is um, just the way that uh, Robert De Niro plays it. And what I mean by that is if I were to compare it to, say, Tracy's story from Accused, which I reviewed not long ago, um, that performance from Sean Bean really felt like he had done a ton of research on how a cross-dresser, you know, behaves and would act and would feel, whereas Robert De Niro just seems to have been told, hey, just mess around in the dress for a bit. And in, while it looks like he's very much having fun, nothing about it reads to me as having an understanding of what a man who wears a dress finds appealing about that. So when he's, you know, looking, you know, with this feather thing, fan at himself I'm like hey. I, I don't know it just it's just a little crap it's not offensive it doesn't offend me it just makes me go oh you didn't need it so it doesn't ruin it but there are those little moments that I kind of could have done without but for the most part I was surprised that I I still feel comfortable saying I like this character so that is Stardust um, like I said, if you haven't seen it, I do recommend it. If you haven't read the book, I recommend the book. Just be aware if you've already seen the movie. Significant difference, mainly in tone, also with ending. Um, but, uh, you, you know, the fundamental, the, the way things end, like, situationally, is the same. It's just there isn't a climax in the book, really. But, uh, other than that, yeah, that'll wrap it up. This was a Patreon sponsored review, which means I have a Patreon link down below, a whole bunch of other stuff besides buttons, links, give them a look, click on them. There's all kinds of links down there. Check them out or don't. Because uh, at the end of the day, folks, you're the council. I just run the meetings. And until next time, this council is adjourned.